Let's see here. How can I add music to the waiting page? Okay, we're going live here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Let's see here. We're good. Got some people coming in here. Can you guys hear me? Are we good? Hit me up on chat. You can say, yeah. Can you add music to the waiting page? I don't know. I, I should try. I, I was going to try to come on a little bit early so we could all kind of hang out before I went on, but I had to, I had to like get some TV on for the girls because it's just me this time. Okay. I'm about to start a meeting for another class. I can post my questions in the chat right now. Yes, definitely. Yes. Now, uh, Melissa, you can, you can, um, can, can chat, uh, send your questions through chat or through email, which I've got a couple emails here. So here's how I want this to go. We're going to do a test review for test three. And I'm actually, um, I think I'm going to have two classes here kind of overlapping a little bit. I'm sorry. It's just the way it has to be. I, uh, I just, um, I, I can't run two hours by myself with the kids. So yeah, we'll, we'll get your questions out and we'll go. And I'm going to see if I can actually, I uh, will just be blue tonight. That's fine. I'm not going to try to fix this. So one thing when you ask questions, what I ask that you not do is just cut and paste the questions from uh, from the the um, the questions, the study review questions that I that I posted. Don't just cut and paste those. Uh, be more specific. Ask me what it is that you that you're not understanding about that. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with uh, an email I got earlier, and I see some questions coming up on the chat. Melissa, I'll get to yours in just a second here, but I've got one that was pretty good because it's on the on the test. So I'm going to do this one first. And this question is, and I believe I have uh, test three study questions right there. Nope, that's the wrong. That's a part two. Let's see here. There we go. It is question number. Oh, gosh, I can't read fast enough. Oh, yeah, number 12. Uh, number 12B specifically. I, I, I almost always ask this question. And the question is uh, basically, you know, when you have a cold water fish versus a warm water fish or a cold water organism or organism in cold environment versus warm environments, what's an adaptation or an acclimation that you can have to your membranes? And the answer to that is if you are in a warmer environment, so the warmer your environment, the more saturated your fatty acid tails are going to be and the longer they're going to be. And as you get warmer, you get more and more thermal energy. You've got more kinetic energy. So these long tails will interact with each other and they'll help keep the membrane viscous. They'll, they'll keep it the right fluidity so things can cross in and out of it. As the temperature gets colder, the fatty acid cells in your membranes get shorter and shorter, and then they will become more uh, polyunsaturated, and that makes kinks in them. And by adding a kink into those tails, it prevents them from solidifying as the temperature gets colder. Because as you're getting colder, what happens as you have less thermal energy, there's less kinetic energy. So a long fatty acid cell that tail that's um, saturated it would just become solid. Think about bacon fat in your refrigerator. It becomes solid, whereas olive oil will um, will um, stay uh, liquid at room temperature. And uh, slow down on the questions over there. You're gonna. I'm gonna run. I'm not gonna be able to get to them all. You got to slow down on me and don't cut and paste. And I'll I'll get to them. Okay. I know you got a lot of questions, but yeah, you gotta give it. I, yeah, that's too fast. I, I can't keep up. Okay. So that's important about that cellular membrane, okay? Just make sure that you understand that the shorter polyunsaturated fatty acids prevent it from solidifying. They keep it fluid with less thermal energy in there, okay? All right, so I wanted to get to that question because that person asked a question that was going to be on the test. And then uh, another one was, um, I, I, this question, I think I, when I worded it, I, it made sense to me, but this question has confused a lot of people. And it says, you know, why do terrestrial and marine animals risk water loss? Okay. The risk part of it isn't the best wording I could have ever used here, but the point is, is that 
both marine animals, like a like a bony fish or any animal in the marine environment, and an animal living on land, they can lose water if they're not careful. And the reason why on land is you lose it through evaporation because water potential is much, much lower in the air. So you're constantly you know, losing water through evaporation. And then in the marine environment, seawater is hyperosmotic to most animals. So like fish, well, except for the chondrichthys, the sharks, of course, but to your bony fish, the osteichthys, marine water, you know, so, so water, salt water, ocean water, whatever, it's 35 parts per thousand. It's, it's hyperosmotic, which means the water potential is lower in the marine environment. So what that means is that water is going to follow your solutes, right? Water is going to go from high potential, low potential. So if you've got fewer solutes inside a fish, then the water is going to leave that fish and go into the marine environment. And the way it's going to leave it mostly is through the gills, right? So what's happening here is that they can both face water loss. So a marine fish drinks lots of water, right? And they're constantly pumping the electrolytes out because not only is the water hyperosmotic to them, the electrolytes constantly want to diffuse into the fish as well. So those are, are um, uh, those are good questions right there. And there was one more. Uh, let's see here. I had a test three. Okay. Oh, this is about negative feedbacks. I I actually wrote the test and forgot to get a negative feedback question in there. So um, I'm not going to worry about that one so much. Okay. And let's get to these top chats here. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, cephalization and bilateral animals because they have this clustering of nerves in the frontal section of their body. So simply because of their body section, their cephalization. Yeah, you know, you're on the right track, Melissa, definitely. I mean, yeah, thanks for trying to answer the question. That's that's awesome. Uh, what's going on there is that if you are an animal that has bilateral symmetry, you've got a front, a back, right, and a left, top and a bottom, right? And you, you, you swim through the environment, right, in one direction. So what happens is your uh, head is always encountering the environment first. So what you do is you put all of your sensory organs on your head, ears, nose, eyes, mouth, right? And your brain right here. So your brain is right next to all your sense organs that are, you know, swimming through the environment like that, right? And then you can rapidly make uh, um, responses to that. So yeah, Melissa, you're, you're on the right track there. Uh, bilateral animals have that cephalization because of like you encounter the environment first and you want to have all your sense organs there and have them close to your brain. Okay. Nidarians don't need a circulatory system because they have radial symmetry. Partly correct. Okay. You're on the right track. Absolutely. And what's going on there is that Nidarians have a very high surface area compared to their volume. Okay. Because you have this really high surface area, you can get the fusion into all parts of the animal. Uh, everywhere it's at, there's always an, it's always close enough to where it can get, you know, materials through diffusion. So it doesn't need a circulatory system. The difference of special fluid connected tissues that it likes fiber is that the only difference? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, the special fluid. I mean, that's your blood. There's there's no collagen fibers in there, or elastins or anything. Uh, it, it, they're just floating through your um, through your blood vessels. And Melissa, I'm sorry, I forgot that you had to go to another uh, test. That's why you're rapid firing on these. Good job on this, by the way. Uh, the difference, let's see, the whole elephant metabolic rate is higher than a shrew, and the shrew is a higher mass specific metabolic rate due to the surface area to volume ratios. Yes, uh, yeah, that's that's three quarters of the answer right there. I and mean, you're really helping your classmates out on this one, right? An elephant. Clearly, as an animal, it's way bigger than a shrew, and it has a, a overall metabolism that's much larger than a shrew. I mean, think about this: in like one gulp of an elephant, you know, it, it has like multiple shrews worth of food, right? But the difference is, an elephant might eat like 0.1 percent of its body weight in a day, whereas a shrew might eat 100 percent of its body weight in a day. And the reason why that, if you were to go mass specific, 
pound for pound, if I took a pound, well, we're in science class. If we took a gram, kilogram of elephant tissue, well, shrews don't weigh, a kil don't weigh a kilogram, a gram. If you took a gram of elephant tissue and a gram of shrew tissue, the shrew tissue is going to have a much higher metabolic rate. It's going to be using a lot more oxygen, breaking down a lot more organic molecules, releasing a lot more carbon dioxide, making a lot more ATP. And the reason why is because an elephant is really big. So it's got a much larger volume compared to its surface area. Because it has a much larger volume to its surface area, it dissipates heat more slowly than a shrew. Shrew's the exact opposite. It's got a very large surface area compared to its volume, right? So it's dissipating heat rapidly. So you, to maintain 98 or whatever, 100 degrees that the shrew is, it has to eat a lot, has a very high metabolism, as it's constantly losing heat to the environment. Whereas if an elephant had the same metabolic rate as a shrew, I don't even think it could eat that much in a, in a day, just a physical constraint. But also, um, man, it would like literally burn up. It would generate so much body heat. Okay. Uh, metabolic rate is measured using the CO2 released or how. Uh, it's also based on oxygen consumption as well. And the reason why is because uh, the, the your base meta metabolism is like how much oxygen you're using. And of course, that the, the flip side of that is CO2, because that gives you an estimate of like how much carbon dioxide, how much organic material you're breaking down. But your base rate metabolism depends on, you know, how much ATP you're making, which is based on oxygen serving as a final electron acceptor. Okay, the role of negative feedback in homeostasis should just define negative feedback. Does it involve the mechanisms like shivering when cold? Hey, you know, actually, as I just said, I I wrote the test and didn't get a question in there on negative feedback oversight on my part. So you guys, you're good. Don't worry about it. It's not on there. All right. Evaporation leads to heat loss because there's a phase change that involves the and the higher energy molecules leave first to the phase change, leaving only lower energy molecules behind. Yeah, that's it. Uh, you know, there's like four different ways that you can transfer heat. Evaporation is one of them. So when you're evaporating, it's the molecules that are leaving, the water molecules that are evaporating have the most thermal energy, they're the most kinetic energy. So when they leave first, because, you know, they're breaking the hydrogen bonds, they're taking away that excess energy with them so you're absolutely right. The average thermal energy of the remaining molecules is lower. You have lower temperature, right? That's exactly how that works. You could think about like if you had a track team and your fastest runners all graduated, the average speed of your track team would go down or actually go up, right? <laughs> you get slower, but you get the idea. Okay, brown fat. Guess what? There's, there's not a question about brown fat on the test and thermogenin. So you guys are good with that one. All right. Yeah. Sorry for the spam, Melissa. No problem. I, I, I forgot very quickly that you had to get out. Nice set of questions, by the way, that was really well done, you know, kind of showing me what you were thinking about for the answers and seeking guidance on that. That was really good. Okay, Alexa, for the exam purposes, would we be allowed to say that energy ultimately comes from what we consume plus air? You know, I, no. <laughs> The reason why I asked this question is because I want you to realize that the energy for almost every living organism on this planet, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. But for us, you and me and all the birds and dogs and trees, the energy in our ecosystems on the surface of the earth come from the sun. And that sunlight is created by fusion. It hits the strikes the earth. That energy and sunlight is converted by a plant through photosynthesis, and then it's stored as a carbohydrate, and that's where we ultimately get our source of energy is from the sun, and we get it from the plants we eat, and if you're eating animals, like I just had some enchiladas earlier, no, chicken quesadillas, sorry, that chicken ate, you know, maybe an insect, like a grasshopper that ate a plant, or ate grains that came from the plant itself. Mm -hmm. I do like where you were going with that, where you were asking um, if it comes from what we consume plus the air, the it, not so much energy from the air, but the oxygen to extract the food we eat. But if I ever ask a question, what's the ultimate source of energy for most life on the on the planet? 
including humans. The energy in you is coming from nuclear fusion inside the sun. And, and I, I love asking that question because it also is a, uh, it's a connection that life has to stars, to stellar processes. We're connected to the universe. And I just love thinking about that kind of stuff. Are poquila, Germain, are poquila thermic animals only endothermic or are they ectothermic and endothermic? Okay. So poquila thermics can change their body weight. I mean, not their body weight. They can change their body temperatures. Here's the type of question I'm asking on the test. Okay. Endotherm versus ectotherm. An endotherm generates heat through metabolism. Okay. So you and I were 98 degrees, not 98.6. That is a test question. We are about 98 degrees. You choose 98.6, you're getting it wrong. But that body heat that you and I are generating right now, that is coming from the foods we break down. Okay, that's our metabolism. Hey, and thanks for the thumbs up, man. That makes me happy. Um, if you are ectothermic, then you're... Body temperature is coming from your surroundings, okay? Now, so we got endotherm, ectotherm. You're either generating body heat through metabolism, endothermic, or your body temperature is dependent on the environment, ectothermy. Now, you can be a heterotherm, which means like your, your, your body temperature can vary, or you can be a homeotherm. Homeotherms, your body doesn't change very much. Hey, we got it doesn't change. You and I are endothermic homeotherms because our body temperature really doesn't fluctuate. You know, 97 to 102, maybe five degrees, you know, that's it. And, and a, a few hundred degrees, you know, like a hundred degrees, you're running a temperature. You drop, start dropping below 96 or so, that's problematic. We maintain it really within 3%. We just don't really change our body temperature that much. So we are endothermic and we are homeotherm. Most lizards, right, are ectotherms and they're heterotherms because their body temperature will fluctuate throughout the day. Now, there are ectotherms like deep sea fish or those Antarctic rock cod. Those fish are ectothermic, but because their environment never changes, they are homeotherms. So, yes, you can have an ectothermic animal that is also a homeotherm for the simple fact their environment temperature never changes like the deep sea fish. So good question here. Okay, Isabella, can I elaborate why humans can't drink seawater? Yes, I can. You'll get dehydrated. And the reason why seawater is hyperosmotic to our cells, right? So that means the water potential inside Seawater, or sea, not inside seawater, seawater is hypertonic to us. The water potential is lower. So when you drink seawater, it's going to actually pull water out of your cells and make you more dehydrated. That's why we can't drink seawater. Okay. I'm a little bit confused about recycling energy in animals, if and how they're able to recycle energy. Okay, metabolism. Let's, let's take a step back here. Metabolism, the sum of all of our chemical reactions. And we, when we eat food, what we're doing is we're extracting energy from the foods we eat. Ultimately, energy came from the sun, right? So what that means is you and I are open systems. Now, these laws of thermodynamics, there's two of them that we care about. Energy can't be created nor destroyed. And every time you use energy, it becomes less, excuse me, less usable because entropy increases. So a couple of things as a test question. We are open systems. Don't confuse that with circulatory systems. We have a closed circulatory system. But thermodynamically, as a, as, a, as a system, we are an open system because energy and materials constantly flow through us. The energy enters us through the foods we eat and exits us through our waste and the heat that we are generating. Okay. Now, um, the reason why you cannot recycle energy is because every time you use that energy, it becomes degraded as entropy increases. That is why all life is an open ecos is an open system that requires a constant flow of energy, not just at the organismal level, but also at the ecosystem level as well. Okay, I hope that answered that. 
so yeah, we can't, and that same applies to our civilization too. We, we can't, uh, we can't recycle energy. That's why we have to have a constant source of it. Okay. How in depth do we need to understand the difference between a two chamber, three chamber, and four chambered heart? Okay. Um, what I did not ask you to do is discuss the full on anatomy of a heart, except for the atria, which receives the blood, and the ventricles that pump the blood. Okay. I'll get my fingers in there. I'm getting out of the screen here. You need to know those two things, right? That's really what I'm talking about. Now, two chambered hearts are in fish because they have just like, it's basically a loop. You've got two capillary beds, one in your gills to pick up oxygen, release carbon dioxide, and release ammonia. Then it goes through the capillary beds of the body, which is the systemic part of it, and then comes back into the atria and the ventricles pump it again. Three chambered heart has two atria, one ventricle. Because the two atria come in and they both dump into the same ventricle, right? Two things. One, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mix, so it's less efficient. Second, your systemic route, which goes through your body, think system, systemic body, and the pulmonary route, which goes through your lungs, are connected to the same ventricle. So not only are you mixing oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, you also can't separate out the systemic route from the pulmonary route. So that limits how high you can send your blood pressure, which limits how big that organism can grow and how active it can be. And in fact, think about this. There's like no salamanders running down prey on the fields of the Masai Mara, right? On the plants of the Masai Mara, they, they just can't do it. Four chambered hearts, two atria, two ventricles, left ventricle is very big, very powerful. It prevents the mixing of the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, which makes for more efficiency in our metabolism, especially for endothermic animals like, uh, like birds and mammals that are very active. And by separating out the, the pulmonary route, which is your lungs, from the systemic route, you can grow much larger because you can take that left ventricle and be huge and just pump that blood throughout a very large organism. Think humpback whale, blue whale, dinosaur, giraffe, especially going up, you know, to the top of the head of a giraffe, right? You got to have a lot of pressure from that ventricle to push that blood all the way up there. If you tried to do that, create that much pressure in the capillary beds around your lungs, you'd blow them out, right? You'd rupture those capillaries. So by having the four chambered heart, this allows animals to become much larger and remain much more active um, because it's much more, um, it's, uh, yeah, you're not mixing that oxygenated, deoxygenated blood. It's much more efficient. That's what you need to know about those things. Okay. Can you please elaborate on how specific about defining characters of animals, my darians, or arthropods? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the very first question on the test is uh, tell me whether or not a sponge is an animal. And it's not that, you have to pick yes or no. I'm, it, it doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with me, actually. In fact, the, the TAs will be, you know, they know this. It's, I'm, I'm a little heretical maverick on this one. Uh, but the point of the question is, do you know the characters that define an animal, right? So if you just say they're multicellular heterotrophs and just leave it at that, well, you know, I mean, that's not very good. That'll get you some points. But what I'm really looking at, do you realize we have tissue layers? There's a blastula stage. There's apoptosis. There's differentiated cells that form, you know, that form cell tissues, that form organs. We actually have defined tissue layers. We have the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. We have special connective tissue and uh, nervous tissue and muscle tissue. And animals, as far as I'm concerned, have nerves and muscles. They can move. Uh, so... Yeah, whereas sponges lack those things, but sponges do have differentiated cells. They have, you know, they've got, they do have apoptosis. They are um, multicellular, sort of. They're a, more of a colony of cells. They don't lack, they don't have organs and specialized tissues, but they do have specialized cells. And animals also have Hox genes because we have a body plan, whether that's radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry. So yeah, I definitely want you to know that. You'll definitely need to know the defining characters of cnidarians, arthropods, mollusks, and, and vertebrates. And it's not hard. I mean, cnidarians, you know, they have uh, the radial symmetry, two tissue layers, 
which are two germ layers. I mean, the germ layers are the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm derived from the blastula stage. The tissue layers are things like your epithelial tissue, tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, and your connective tissue. Um, yeah, so there, that's it. So arthropods, exoskeleton, jointed limbs, vertebrates have a dorsal nerve cord, put muscular postanal tail. That's basically all you need to know for that. Um, Micah, do we need to know the equation of CO2 being diffused into the bloodstream? No, I, I won't have you have that uh, equation on there, but you do need to know the Bohr shift. You do need to know about cooperative binding because I'm going to ask on the test questions like uh, when during strenuous exercise, what's going to happen in your blood? Things like, well, it's under strenuous exercise, you're going to start releasing more carbon dioxide. That's going to quickly get converted to carbonic acid. It's going to lower the pH, right? This is the Bohr shift because the hemoglobin is going to pick up the proton. And when it picks up that proton, it's going to release more oxygen. And also the cooperative binding as, as one oxygen comes off the hemoglobin, it makes it easier for the second and third and fourth ones to come off. So you can almost get like most of your oxygen unloaded during strenuous exercise because of cooperative binding and the Bohr shift. And then at your lungs, as carbon dioxide is being converted, or I should say bicarbonate and carbonic acid is being converted back to carbon dioxide, uh, the, B, the pH of the blood rises just a tad bit, which increases the inf infinity, the affinity for uh, oxygen in the hemoglobin, whereas a lower pH decreases its affinity, which helps get rid of it. That's the Bohr shift. So yeah, you definitely want to know that. Okay. All right, can you elaborate on describing bilateral animals in a tube? Yeah, you know, uh, think about it this way. I mean, every animal that has bilateral symmetry is a mouth and a butt. And in between that is a tube. It's a digestive tract. And that digestive tract can be very simple, as in a simple worm, or it could be uh, very convoluted, like a human, or even more convoluted, like in a deer or a uh, some herbivore, especially like a deer or a cow, where they've got the all the different chambers of the stomach and the large cecum and everything to you know break down all the cellulose. And outside of that tube is all the organs and the shape of the animal, right? I mean, it's, yeah, so we're, we, we have all these different appendages and body shapes and forms to basically acquire nutrients from our environment. And that tube is, of course, adapted to the type of nutrition we're eating. Short tubes tend to be favored for uh, carnivores, longer, more convoluted ones for herbivores because, well, uh, vegetables have a lot less, uh, they're a lot less energy dense and it takes a lot more to break them down. Okay, can you go over the Bohr shift and how it relates to oxygen transport? Is it a shift in oxygen disassociated caused by changes in concentration? Yeah, you're you're on the right track, Jackie. I mean, it's not the or the pH of the environment. It's, it, it is a change in the pH. So think about this. You start exercising. You start breathing harder. Your body temperature goes up. You start sweating, right? What's happening is as your muscles are doing more work, you need more energy. So you start burning more carbohydrates, more fats, more proteins that creates more carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide diffuses into your blood. Carbonic anhydrase converts carbon dioxide into uh, carbonic acid, which because of the pH of the blood being slightly alkaline, 7.4, that proton pops off, it acts as an acid, it lowers the pH. The hemoglobin picks up that pH, acts as a blood buffer, but by picking up the pH, it causes oxygen on that curve to shift to the right and it loses its affinity for oxygen. So the hemoglobin will unload even more oxygen under strenuous exercise. Now, when the blood gets near your lungs, the reverse happens. The protons are released from, you know, they go back to uh, carbonic acid. The carbonic acid retransforms back into carbon dioxide and diffuses out of your lungs. The blood pH slightly ticks upward because of the loss of protons. That causes the hemoglobin to increase its affinity for oxygen. So the, the shift will, that, that curve goes up to the left a little bit. And that's good because in your lungs, you want your oxygen to basically pick up, I mean, so you want your hemoglobin to pick up the oxygen. So the rise in pH, like I said, helps you uh, pick up the oxygen 
And of course, cooperative binding is working with the boar shift as well. Okay. All right. Reacts with water to form carbonic acid. And there's an increase in carbon dioxide, which causes a decrease in blood pH, reducing their load of oxygen. Yeah, Jackie, you got it. Good job. On how shark can be isoosmotic, but alkative equilibrium with seawater, is it related to urea? Anki, that's really, yeah, you're on the right track. And good question. Yes, a shark can be isoosmotic because that's a function of the water potential. How much solutes do you have in your, in either the seawater or in the shark? And they're the same. So the shark's not gaining or losing water. However, it's out of equilibrium because the sharks are still removing salt, right? They're still pumping that salt out and removing it. And as a result, they have very little salts in their body, just like most fish. But they, you're right, they have urea, which is also water soluble. And that urea is what's making them isoosmotic, osmotic to, uh, I got my kid came in here to see me, isoosmotic to the seawater. So yes, uh, so you're out of equilibrium for the simple fact that um, you still have a concentration gradient of salt inside and outside the shark and with urea too, because the ocean water is clearly doesn't have a lot of urea in it. So that's how you can still be out of equilibrium with your environment, even though you're isoosmotic. Okay. Are malpigian tubules used to pump potassium into the tubules, bring water, other electrolytes, and nitrogenous waste? Hey, Jackie, that's a great question. Uh, here, here's your test question for it. I'm going to make it easy on you guys. The malpigian tubule, tubules are the equivalent of kidneys in uh, arthropods to remove nitrogenous waste. There you go. <laughs> uh, when asking about heterothermic species of hummingbirds, does this refer to their torpor to conserve energy? Yes. Uh, uh, hummingbirds are, 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 of course, endothermic, uh, but their metabolism is so high, they can literally starve to death in a few hours, four or five hours. So at night, they will lower their body temperature and go into torpor to save energy. So they are heterothermic. Okay. Is base me metabolic rate just another way of saying mass-specific metabolic rate? No, your base metabolic rate is based on your oxygen consumption. Uh, mass specific, what you need to know about that is that the shrew is higher than the elephant that I talked about earlier. Okay, is the issue with the term cold-blooded rather than ectotherm is that the blood isn't always cold, but rather the animal depends on outside temperature for its processes. Danny, that's definitely part of it. Um, the reason why cold-blooded is bad is not a good descriptor. <laughs> My kids are losing it back there. Is the uh, the desert iguana is a great example, right? I mean, we think of lizards as being cold-blooded, but these animals, even in New Mexico, that live in the desert, their body temperatures, they like it in the 90s. And these desert iguanas, they get up to like 115 degrees. That's not very cold-blooded. I mean, you and I, we die at 115 degrees. We're dead. There's no way a human can survive a body temperature of 115 so the idea that calling, you know, reptiles cold-blooded isn't necessarily true because, you know, a lot of them are, do maintain really warmer body temperatures and they do it behaviorally. Okay. Can you elaborate on the trade-offs between ectothermy and endothermy? Yeah. You know, if you're an ectotherm, think about it this way. Uh, your body temperature relies on the environment around you. So you don't have to spend a lot of energy maintaining body temperature. You just Whatever the outside is, that's what you are. So you require a lot less energy, but you are only active when it's warm enough. So like lizards, they're not active in the winter time. They're not active when it's cold. They have to warm, wake up, warm up in the sun, and then they can become active. On the exact opposite of that is an endotherm. You and I, 30 degrees outside, we can go run a marathon. No problem. The difference is... Uh, how many times have you eaten today, right? Well, I mean, if you're doing Ramadan, you won't eat for another hour or two, right? But uh, in general, humans eat throughout the day, most mammals and most endotherms. Uh, while you can be active, uh, regardless of what the temperature is outside, uh, you require a lot more energy to maintain the, and that higher metabolism. 
Would you say there's no perfectly Hi. adapted animal because they can't be in equilibrium with their environment? No, Esmeralda, I, actually, um, that's not entirely right. But I do see where you're going with that, though. Uh, you know, like I can understand like being in equilibrium, we get this idea that's a good thing. Uh, being in equilibrium with your environment means you're not alive anymore. Uh, you'd be some water, carbon dioxide, and some minerals, basically, and some nitrates, and that's about it. What it means is that every time you adapt to do one thing well, you do another thing less well. Even in human, run and run and run, versus a lifter who can lift a lot of weights. Think like Arnold Schwarzenegger versus Lance Armstrong, right? That's a perfect example of a trade-off. There's no way Arnold could easily keep up with Lance on a bike, nor Lance could either even come close to bench pressing Arnold Schwarzenegger because the difference here is their muscles are adapt or acclimated for either extreme endurance or strength. There's a trade-off. You want more endurance, you give up strength, vice versa. You get the idea. So no matter what adaptation you have, there's always a trade-off, which means you can't be perfectly adapted to everything. Okay. Oh, not, somebody said hi, Willow. Yeah, thanks for saying hi. She's she's the girls are needing attention. Okay, uh, Selena. So explain how CO two and O two function to bore shift. You know what? I've I, I've already covered that actually twice, but that's a fantastic question. It is on the test and it's on an earlier part of this. Um, okay, cooperative binding and hemoglobin. Jackie, let me just cover this really quick. Just. Uh, I've covered the bore shift a couple times. Cooperative binding is this. Your hemoglobin carries 98.5% of all of your oxygen in your blood. If your hemoglobin is near your lungs, it's coming from your body and it's mostly depleted in oxygen. So when the oxygen dissolves into your blood and binds to the first hemoglobin molecule, it causes a shape change in that hemoglobin molecule to make it easier for the next oxygen to attach. Having two on there makes it easier for the third one. You get the idea that makes it easier for the fourth one. Then when the hemoglobin goes down to where your muscles are or the rest of your body where it needs oxygen, that first oxygen pops off. It changes the shape, makes it easier for the third one to come off. The second one, you get the idea. And then that's where the other question about the bore shift, when you start straining uh, exercise, that lowers the pH and causes even more release of the oxygen. Danny, just to confirm that I heard you right, you said the test average body temperature of humans will be 98 degrees. Yeah, there you go. There's a test question right there. Don't choose 98.6. I said that in class, and I'll tell you guys here. Here's a free test. Here's two points for you. It's not 98, and if I forgot to put it on the test, I'll give it to you as a bonus question. Um, just remind me if you don't see it, I'm, but I'm certain I put it on there. All right. Daniela, is it safe to say the trade-off for endotherms is that they're energetically expensive and ectotherms have restrictions to perform high energy activities due to their environment? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Daniela, that's a good job. Uh, you know, ectotherms can only be most active when it's warm enough for them to be active. And if it's too cold, they can't be as much as active, but they have a lot less metabolic demands. I mean, gosh, if you've ever seen somebody with a boa, feed that thing once a month, right? Humans, man, we got to eat every day. All right. Um, I'm a little confused how you can't adapt to your environment. Is it because the adaptation is due to... Oh, yeah, Esme, that's a really good question. Why can't you adapt to your environment? And that has to go... A lot of your confusion is because of the way we use the word adaptation in our everyday language versus adaptation from an, a scientific or evolutionary point of view. You'll even have, like the Marines will say, we must adapt. We must adapt to a changing world. So here's what's happening, Esme, is that adaptations occur in a population over time as their genes are changing. As you change specifically your allele frequencies to make you better fit to your environment. And because as an individual, your genes aren't changing to fit the environment, you are not adapting you are acclimating. So if you go out and get a tan, like um, I, I have a bit of a tan line, you can't really see it, but I do. It's been sunny out today. So as, as um, 
as my skin is getting darker, that is an acclimation. I've also started hiking more. So there's physiological changes, like I'm getting more mitochondria back in my thighs, uh, in my thigh muscles, you know, more mitochondrial density. There's changes in my heart to associate with that extra load. These are acclimations. And the reason why is I'm having these physiological changes, like more melanin produced by a skin cell called a melanocyte, for those of you in your AMP classes. Um, that's that acclimation. I'm not changing my genetics around to become darker skinned or to increase, you know, my physiological responses to more exercise. I'm also trying to work out. So I'm trying to maintain muscle mass, right? That's also an acclimation. Uh, like I said, you know, you're, you're not changing your genetics. Now your ability to acclimate is determined by your genetics, right? Like no matter what, I'll never get really dark because, well, I mean, my, my ancestors are from the islands, you know, Ireland and Scotland and Britain and Kennedy, Houlihan, Craigs and Dollars and Woods. I mean, that's about as pasty white as you can be. So there's only a limit to what I can I can acclimate to. OK. Yeah, you're welcome. Micah, how in depth should we be expecting to the process of kidneys? Well, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I spent a day talking about the, the nephron, right? So what you're going to need to know is that nephron, there's four main parts to it. And I would know the general processes of what happened in each part of those nephrons, like the renal corpuscular, cor cor sorry, the renal corpuscle. That's where you have filtration. The loop of Henle has reabsorption from a strong osmotic gradient. Uh, so these are the things that you'll want to know. The proximal tubule, that's doing reabsorption by using active transport. So that's the kind of stuff you need to know. Um, what would be a good comparison between the osmotic balance between freshwater and marine bony fish? Well, if you remember, uh, the marine fish are, hyper, are in a hyperosmotic environment, so they're in danger of losing water. Freshwater fish are in a hypoosmotic environment. They're in danger of gaining water. So marine fish are constantly, you know, drinking lots of water and, and pumping out electrolytes and freshwater fish are doing the exact opposite. They're, they're urinating water, not drinking it, and they're actually pumping in electrolytes. Uh, and then fish like the mullet, striped mullet, they can swim back and forth between marine and, um, sorry, marine and freshwater environments. And those pumps that are used, those co-transporters, will actually start flipping sides. They'll, slip, they'll flip from the apical side to the basal or lateral side, depending on whether or not that organism is in a marine or terrestrial environment. Okay. Wow. You guys did a fantastic job. I mean, the questions you guys were asking and, and, and throwing out there where you were going with that, I, I just really appreciate the effort uh, that you guys are putting into that and uh, just checking some of your answers to show me that you've actually um, – uh, done some of the work ahead of time, you know, that's, that is the best way to do this, you know, try to come up with the answer. Let's check it. Let's see if you're on the right track or if you're on the wrong track. Hey, now's the time to, to fix that. So even if your answers weren't on the right track, Hey, great on you throwing it out there to just double check. This is a, a learning experience. And uh, I also admire anybody to, to, to uh, do this chat top chat because you're really putting yourself out there. Uh, that everybody can see your questions. Um, so fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of you. Oh, I have a wet baby. <laughs> All right. She's wearing her uh, little shirt, sir. So I don't see any more questions. Um, looks like we're all done here. Hey, thanks everybody for coming out. I'll admit, you know, I love the thumbs up when you guys give them. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like you guys appreciate this. You know, just like every other person that gets out there on social media, we love that valid that validation. So you guys, thanks a lot. You're welcome. You know, I enjoy doing this stuff. And, um, I love love interacting. You're you're you guys are a fantastic class. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, and hey, thanks for all of your patience too with uh with all of the things going on. Wife is working nanny, more nanny, than she has in a year, nanny. which is good for us. But, you know, when you're stay-at-home dad and trying to do a job and, and do all this, it's, it gets a little hard. So, yeah, thank you all. All right. I will see you in class tomorrow. And you guys got this. You got this test. You're going to rock it. I'll see you tomorrow. Hi, Willow.